Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I am your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Do it! Anyway, uh, this is the third and final episode in my in-depth series on New Zealand wine, or the seventh in the overall series. The first episode covered overall history, wine law, climate, soils, etc. The second episode covered the North Island, while this episode covers the South Island. These three episodes are going to be at a SOM school advanced level and will be intended for those of us studying for exams at all levels. With that said, I'll be using the Court of Master Sommelier's Europe's 2023 syllabus as my guideline on what to cover. I frequently call them a UK chapter because well, that's where they're founded, uh, but they're officially called Europe, like the other one is called Americas. Anyway, CMS Europe has yet to release their 2024 syllabus, at least as of the writing of the script in December 2023. Now, you may ask, why not use the American chapter syllabus? Well, as I said in the other two episodes, because it does exist on their website, at least not the last time I checked, something I and others have complained about the past few years. Either way, essentially, the syllabus I'm using is valid for both sides of the pond. I have an extensive list of links for this episode in the, in the description. This list will probably be the same for all three episodes. I encourage you to explore further, especially the links directly related to this episode. While I tried to limit uh, what to cover, while I tried to limit it to what the syllabus covers, I do include additional information for context or because I think it's important to know or it's just cool, but I think you should know it for your professional life. As a reminder, let's look at the New Zealand GI system. So we have the North Island first, and then in the North Island, we have Northland GI, Auckland GI, Matakana GI, Kumeu GI, Waiheke Island GI, Gisborne GI, Hawke's Bay, or Hawke's Bay, with, with or without apostrophe GI, Central Hawke's Bay GI, Wairapa GI, then the South Island GIs, are Nelson GI, Marlboro GI, Canterbury GI, North Canterbury GI, Waipara Valley or Waipara GI, Waitaki North Otago or Waitaki Valley GI, Central Otago GI, and Bannockburn GI. Remember that New Zealand itself is considered a GI, along with each North and South Island. All right, let's continue with the South Island. Nelson. So the New Zealand wine growers textbook describes Nelson as tiny, but we need to understand that's using acreage under vine. The actual GI is actually very large. It takes its name from the small region and the city named Nelson that's in the upper northeast part of the GI. Ironically, it doesn't appear that there are any significant vineyards actually in Nelson. They are all in the Tasman region. I'm going to guess they went with Nelson here because uh, they wanted to avoid confusion with, well, Tasmania. And all this was named after that dude, Tasman. The Tasman region, oh, yeah, I just said that. The Tasman region is named after the Duchess War, Abel Janzoon uh, Tasman. I wonder if Jan's wine is named after him too. In addition, the Tasman Sea and, the Ta and Tasmania are named after him. The Tasman Sea stretches from New Zealand to Eastern Australia, including the Eastern part of Tasmania. Viticulture happens in select values within the Nelson GI. Much of the Nelson GI is mountainous. These are the Tasman Mountains, which are part of the Southern Alps. As a result, you don't have the strong westerly winds. Also, all viticulture happens near the ocean, so you have the moderating effect as well. This helps mitigate frost. You do have the potential of rain during harvest. Now, average sunlight hours are 2,405. Only Marlboro has as much. The rest of the country is much less. Nelson is one of the sunniest parts of New Zealand. Average rainfall is 970 millimeters or 38 inches. This is the highest for the South Island. Even so, there is enough protection from the mountains to provide a good diurnal shift. Viticulture began in the mid-1800s from German settlers. By 1895, Nelson was becoming recognized as having impressive potential. However, like much of New Zealand, it wasn't until the 1970s that viticulture really started, albeit on a smaller scale than most places. 
Most viticulture happens in two regions, Muteri Hills and Waimea Plains. Guild Psalms Compendium also lists Motueka and Takaka as subregions, but I'm guessing viticulture is limited there since the New Zealand wine growers uh, website and textbook doesn't mention either one of them. Even so, none of these are GIs anyway. So, however, however, I'll briefly talk about the first two. The Waimea Plains are just southwest of the city of Nelson, but they are in the Tasman region. Side note, while Nelson and Tasman are regions, the name of the regional council in Tasman is the Tasman District Council. This isn't important for an exam, just that districts are a subcategory of regions in New Zealand. It's me being a term nerd. Words mean things, so I try to use proper terminology most of the time. Okay, back to the Waimea Plains. Waimea is Maori for river garden. Lots of agriculture happens here. Stony alluvial soils are found in the flat terrain here. The proximity to the ocean provides a lighter and fresher style than in Muteri. Um, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay appear to be the stars here. The Muteri Hills are farther west, a little bit farther inland, and part of it surrounded on three sides by the Tasman Mountains. It's a bit warmer, but wetter area than the Waimea Plains. Soils here are gravel and clay. Pinot Noir, Sauvignon Blanc, and Chardonnay get mentions from the New Zealand Wine Growers website. There are significant plantings of Pinot Gris in the GI, but it's not really mentioned here. A total of 1,028 hectares are planted in the Nelson GI. Here are the top plantings. Sauvignon Blanc at 621 hectares, Pinot Noir at 164 hectares, Pinot Gris at 111 hectares, Chardonnay at 109 hectares, and then another 20 varieties totaling 77 hectares. The most important producers to know are New Dwarf Vineyards, Green Huff Vineyard, uh, Seyfried Estate Cellar Door. And this is the first mention of Cellar Door here. You'll find that term to be common in New Zealand, Australia, and South Africa. Essentially, that means a winery has a tasting room and or retail location open to the public. Some wineries don't sell directly to consumers, so they don't have a, quote, cellar door license. Some may, but just don't use that term. If you see it, then you know you can buy wine at that location. On to what is arguably the most important region in New Zealand. Marlborough! Anyway, I cover a good amount uh, of the region in relation to that sweet map I just showed you that I got in the first episode of the entire series. However, I really concentrated on the map and not the region in terms of wine. The first plantings were of brown muscat vines in 1873 by David Hurd in the Ben Morvan Valley. This is one of the five southern valleys near the town of Blenheim. The five valleys from west to east are Waihopai, Omaka, Brancott, Ben Morvan, or Ben Morvan on the map, and Taylor. These valleys are formed, in, are formed from tributaries of the Wairau River. Those vines from David Hurd were eventually pulled with the last of them pulled in 1931. There is a current vineyard there owned by Ansfield Estate. Uh, no vineyards were planted for another 40 years. Commercial winemaking didn't fully resume until 1973 when Montana wines planted large-scale vineyards in Marlboro. This wasn't by accident. At the time, Frank Yukich, founder of Montana, was in search of, a cheap, of cheaper land to expand the company's vineyards. But he wasn't looking for land for bulk juice. He wanted to expand to, into a more premium set of wines for, for export. The North Island's land prices were too expensive in the, quote, proven wine regions. So uh, to the south, he looked after Montana's viticulturist Wayne Thomas wrote a detailed report about how Marlboro had the best potential for wine growing. They then searched for large tracts of land they could purchase, kind of on the sly. Through their agent, they identified 29 hectares of land. Of that land, they put a 10% deposit down on 1,173 hectares. When the board of directors found out, they weren't too happy, but Frank persisted. He eventually got a few experts to justify viticulture and Marlboro. They came up with four reasons as to why Marlboro was the ideal place for viticulture. They are maximum sunshine, minimum rainfall, especially during vintage or during the growing season, free draining soil of medium fertility, and freedom from seasonal frosts. This changed the board's mind and they went ahead with the final purchase. This was the beginning of Brancott Estate, when the vineyards were planted. Frank proclaimed that, quote, wines from here will become, the, will become world famous. Uh, no one took him seriously back then. <laughs> Guess they're taking him seriously now. Uh, 
By the early 1980s, Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc was getting noticed with both Hunters and Cloudy Bay getting international recognition in the mid 80s. Hunters was founded by Ernie and Jane Hunter. Ernie's Fumé Blanc received a gold medal for the best non-Chardonnay, still dry white wine of the Sunday Times Vintage Festival, Vintage Festival in London in 1986. First time any wine from Marlboro was even accepted into the competition. But Ernie tragically died a year later, but his wife continued on and has received many recognitions for her own contributions to viticulture over the years. Hunter's is still family owned and is the oldest family owned winery in the region. Cloudy Bay is consistently considered a top Sauvignon Blanc producer and is, is one you should know. It started as a boutique winery in 1985, founded by David Honan. He also founded Cape Mentale Vineyards in the Margaret River in Western Australia. In 2003, Honan sold his remaining shares to Veuve Clicquot, which makes, its part, makes it part of the LVMH portfolio. Despite all this attention paid to Sauvignon Blanc, much of the vineyards in Marlboro were bulk varieties like Merlot Turgau and Chenin Blanc. Because of the nationwide glut of bulk wine, the New Zealand government enacted a vine pull program in the mid-1980s, paying growers, get this, 6,175 New Zealand dollars per hectare that was pulled. Now, they didn't have any restrictions about replanting other varieties, so many of these growers just replaced their bulk wines with Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay and then other varieties that were more marketable. In addition to this, phylloxera appears, so that forced everyone to replant their vines. Any remaining bulk vines effectively disappear in favor of the more marketable vines. This marks the beginning of Marlboro's rise as a premier wine growing region. Over the years, more and more vines are planted. Wineries big and small either source from here or come here to make wine. While Marlboro doesn't have any official sub GIs, there are a few wine growing areas that you need to know. There, there are different lists out, but the map, this map, that I recently received from the Appalachian Marlboro Wine Organization uh, has the best representation of all of the areas. So we have Wairau Valley, Southern Valleys, Waihopai, Omaka, Brancott, Ben Morvan or Ben Morvan, uh, Taylor, Lower Wairau, Dillon's Point, Grovetown, Spring Creek, Rarangi, 17 Valley, Central Wairau, Rapara, Condors Bend, Woodburn, Fair Hall, North Bank, Upper Wairau, Awatere and Blind River, Coastal Awatere, Dashwood, Seaview, Inland Awatere, Blind River or Otuero, Southern Coast, Ward or Flaxburn, Waima Ure, and Kekerengu. Yeah, that's a lot to remember. The major ones to really know are Wairau Valley and Awatere. After that, the Southern Valleys are important as many high quality vineyards are located there. Not saying you need to know all five, just know them as a whole. Let's revisit the four reasons the experts said Marlboro showed the greatest potential for viticulture. Maximum sunshine, minimum rainfall, especially during the growing season, free draining soil of medium fertility and freedom from seasonal frosts. Effectively climate and soil. First, maximum sunshine. The Maori refer to the Wairau Valley as Ke Puta Te Wairu, or the place with the hole in the cloud. Kind of cool. Uh, the region gets an average of 2,409 sunlight hours, effectively the same as Nelson. Both regions get the most sunlight hours of the entire country. Next, minimal rainfall. Annual rainfall is 655 millimeters or 28 inches. Now we're getting to an amount that is easier to manage in the vineyard, but it's not just the annual rainfall, it's also the rainfall during the growing season, especially at harvest. During the growing season from September to April, the region averages 433 millimeters or 17 inches. During harvest, February gets 49 millimeters or 1.9 inches, March 47 millimeters or 1.9 inches, and April 53 millimeters or 2.1 inches. Since the rains are minimal during harvest, this allows long hang time. Additionally, there is a large diurnal shift here, so acidity is maintained even with the long hang time. All of this is because of the rain shadow effect of the Southern Alps. Four major ranges throughout the region provide this protection. Richmond Range in Wairau, the Blairish Range in Awatere, Inland Kaikoura Range in the Southern Coast, Seaward Kaikoura Range in the Southern Coast. Elevations range from a few hundred meters or feet to as much as 2,900 meters or almost 9,500 feet. 
This also helps protect from seasonal frosts. Soils are essentially free-draining stony soils. Let's highlight the three major areas as listed on the New Zealand Wine Growers site. In Wairau, you find old riverbed and riverbank soils. You will find a variety of aspects and rainfall as, as many areas will be right up against the mountains. So this will, this will create a lot of different mesoclimates. Overall, you'll find a cooler and drier climate, especially in the farther inland you go with the coastal areas having a more moderate climate, kind of like everywhere else. Soils will have more gravel to the north near the riverbed. Gray wacky is everywhere due to the Southern Alps and that being the major rock that makes up the mountains. Within Wairau, you'll find the Southern Valleys. They are from west to east, Waihopai, Omaka, Brancat, Ben Morvan or Ben Morvan, and Taylor. The reason I say that, I'm sure you can see it, uh, sometimes you make it one word or two words for Ben Morvan. Climate wise, we have cooler climates, which get cooler and drier the farther south you go into these valleys. You also find more clay in these valleys. Plus, you'll find an emphasis on Pinot Noir here. The Awatere Valley is very distinct geographically. Sandwiched between the Blairich and the Kaikoura Ranges, we see even cooler, drier, but windier climate. Elevations tend to be much higher on average than Wairau, which contributes to the climate. You also find lower yields here than Wairau. Soils are composed of alluvial gravel and wind borne less. Marlborough is by far the most planted region at 29,145 hectares. Here is the breakdown of the top four varieties. Sauvignon Blanc at 23,834 hectares, Pinot Noir at 2,733 hectares, Pinot Gris at 1,237 hectares, and Chardonnay at 1,083 hectares. There's another 28 varieties for a total of 527 hectares. So yeah, basically four varieties with Sauvignon Blanc being, being the most, being almost 82% of plantings. While New Zealand is like most New World areas with very little regulation as compared to the EU's heavily regulated vineyard and winemaking laws, an organization was formed to create a higher standard from, uh, for wines from Marlboro. That organization is called the Appalachian Marlboro Wine. It was created in 2018. It has 53 members as of this video. They quote, administer a global trademark and certification process to further the integrity and quality standards of Marlboro wine. To qualify, wines must be made entirely from sustainably grown grapes from Marlboro, comply with cropping rates set annually, and be bottled in New Zealand. Starting with the 2022 vintage, qualifying wines must, be also, must also be approved by an independent tasting panel, end quote. In 2013, another organization was created to promote the making of traditional methods sparkling wines called Method Marlboro. There are four criteria wines must meet and are similar to those in Champagne. Wines must be grown, bottled, matured, and disgorged in Marlboro. Wines must be made using the traditional method of production. Wines must be produced with classic sparkling varieties only, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Pinot Meunier. Wines must be aged for a minimum of 18 months on lease to the first disgorgement of any batch. The main difference with Champagne is in Champagne, the minimum aging is 15 months, but that is for non-vintage Champagne. For vintage Champagne, the minimum is 36 months, but most producers continue to age at least a few years more. Right now, current releases I've seen for vintage Champagne is anywhere from 2008 to 2014, kind of depending on the producer. And some Champagne houses will release later vintages before older vintages um, if they feel the older vintage needs more time. Also, Champagne allows a total of seven grapes versus the three here. Those seven grapes are Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Meunier, not Pinot Meunier, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, also known as Fromental, Arbane, and Petit Meslier. Now, new to the Champagne AOP regulations is the grape Voltus. Right now, it's so new that there's really nothing to know other than it's in an experimental trial and can't be more than 5% of a property's plantings. It's only allowed to be a maximum of 10% of the blend. All right, anyway, the idea is to create the Marlboro equivalent of, to Champagne. There are currently 12 members, Johannes Off Cellars, S's Wines, Spy Valley Wines, Nautilus, Whitehaven Wines, Number One Family Estate, Pernod Ricard, New Zealand, Hunter's Wines, St. Clair Family Estate, Daniel Lebrun, now he's the one who spearheaded the effort,
Tohu Wines, LV by Louis Valvasor. I've only had a couple of these and they're pretty fantastic. It's been a long time, so I don't have a great memory of them, but I find it's really hard to truly replicate champagne out of champagne outside of there. But there are individual producers out there that either really are close or are effectively the same, but it's, it's, it's difficult. There are a ton of producers of Marlboro wine. Many are based here too. Some producers you need to know are Alan Scott, Cloudy Bay, From Winery, Hunter's Wines, St. Clair, Spy Valley, Brancott Estate, and Grey Wacky. Know that there are many others based here, plus many, many more that either own vineyards here or source fruit from here. Okay, moving on, Canterbury. Yet another GI where it's a very large area, but all the viticulture really happens in a small part of it. Essentially, you, we can ignore Canterbury itself and concentrate on its two sub-GIs, North Canterbury and Waipara Valley. As a reminder, Waipara Valley is not a sub-GI of North Canterbury, even though it's wholly inside of it. If you didn't watch the previous episode, I mentioned this fact there. Also, if you go to the Intellectual Property Office website, it's not listed as a sub-GI. It's, it's, it's a sub-GI of Canterbury, but not North Canterbury. The first planting occurred in 1978 in the town of Belfast, just north of Christchurch. Plantings followed to the southwest and the north of Waipara. Currently, there are some vineyards getting planted towards Wika Pass in the western part of Waipara. As is common on the South Island, the Southern Alps again provide protection from the westerlies. Even less rainfall here at 648 millimeters or 25 inches, but also less sunlight hours at 2100 hours. But it is a sunny climate and the summers are considered warm, averaging 19 to 22 degrees Celsius or 67 to 71 degrees Fahrenheit for highs. The Southern Alps also produce the phone or nor'wester winds, as they are lo called locally, which add to the heat during the summer. With that said, we are also right on the ocean, so there is a tempering effect to balance the warm winds, warm winds and summer heat. While rainfall is about 25 inches per year, during the growing season they get about 15 inches, so irrigation is used to mitigate any droughts. Harvest time doesn't see significant rain. The area also gets good diurnal shifts, which extend extends the growing season. There are lots of different soil types to be found in the region. In the north, it's mostly gray wacky gravel deposits along with limestone derived clay on the hillsides. The North Canterbury Plains, which surround Christchurch, are mainly shallow free draining stony soils with varying alluvial deposits. Waipara Valley is where the vast majority of vineyards are located, as in almost 90%. So that is the area that is the most important one. Within that GI, there are two subregions that are mentioned, uh, Glasnevin and Om Omihi. Glasnevin is on the valley floor while Omihi is in the hilly area to the north. Soils are gravels and clays. We find the nor'wester is more prominent here than it is to the south. Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are the main grapes here. In addition to these, you find three subregions, not GIs though, that are in North Canterbury. To the northwest of Waipar is Waikari. This is a hilly area with significant limestone outcrops. Near Christchurch is the Canterbury Plains and Banks Peninsula. The Canterbury Plains is obviously mostly flat areas. The Banks Peninsula is very hilly if not a little mountainous. The plains is composed of free-draining shallow gray wacky based gravel soils. It's also cooler than the regions to the north and there is less protection from the Southern Alps. Riesling and Pinot Noir are the main grapes here with it also having the oldest Pinot Noir vines in New Zealand. The, new, the vineyard stats are just for North Canterbury. There is a total of 1,497 hectares planted. The top varieties are Pinot Noir for 444 hectares, Sauvignon Blanc 401 hectares, Riesling 271 hectares, Pinot Gris 215 hectares, and Chardonnay is 99 hectares. There's another 20 varieties that are 67 hectares. And what I mean by it's just North Canterbury, so while Wairapa is not a sub-GI of North Canterbury, the statistically, they are grouped together. So like I said, 90% of Waipara is, is what's planted in, in the, the region, or the 90% of the plains are in, in Waipara, but they put everything under North Canterbury for statistical purposes. As far as wineries based here uh, that you need to know, you only, really, you only really need to know just two. 
Pyramid Valley Vineyards in Pegasus Bay. All right, we're almost done. We have two more GIs. Waitaki Valley is next. Honestly, there's really nothing here. The first plantings were in 2001. It's got a lot of stony, rocky limestone soils that retain heat well. It's truly a valley as it's surrounded by the Southern Alps. So it gets relatively little rainfall at 541 millimeters or 21 inches, but low sunlight hours at 1,817. Other than that, there's a total of 59 hectares planted. Now here's the breakdown. Pinot Noir, 24 hectares, Pinot Gris, 17 hectares, Riesling, 7 hectares, Chardonnay, 6 hectares, and then other varieties, there's 10 of them at 5 hectares. Yeah, not much, right? There aren't any producers based here worth knowing. I know of at least one central Otago winery that has a small vineyard here. Now for the last GI, Central Otago. This is home to the southernmost wine growing area in the world. It also has the highest elevation vineyards in the country. Grape growing first started here in the 1860s. There was even wine from here that won a gold medal in, the 18, in 1881 in Sydney. In the late 19th century, viticulturist Romeo Borgato was tasked by the New Zealand government to survey the country to find regions showing great potential for wine growing. He said of Central Otago, quote, there does not appear to be any stateable limit to the productiveness of that magnificent territory, end quote. He suggested that Pinot Noir in Riesling would be ideal grapes for the area. He also said, quote, there was no country on the face of the earth which produced better burgundy grapes than were produced in central Otago, end quote. That's a pretty strong move there, buddy. I've said for a few years that New Zealand ranks very high on my preference for Pinot Noir. Tasmania and Sancerre are also up there. This isn't to throw shade at Burgundy by any means. Great wines come from there, especially at the Premier and Grand Cru levels. But I'll say that dollar for dollar, New Zealand along with Tasmania and Sancerre go toe to toe for that $20 to $50 bottle of Pinot Noir. Despite all this, viticulture never took hold until the 1980s. Up until then, the main agriculture was stone fruit orchards. The first commercial production of Pinot Noir wasn't until 1987. Since then, there have been increased vineyard plantings. The climate here is semi-continental. Like the Waitaki Valley, we are surrounded by the Southern Alps or right up against them. Because of the climate, frost is expected and planned for. The way the New Zealand Wine Growers website puts it, quote, in this semi-continental climate, frosts are an accepted and, and planned for hazard. However, the marked diurnal variation, high sunshine, and short hot summers provide an eloquent, if brutal, landscape for vines. Site selection is everything. Dry autumns and overall low humidity are significant assets, helping to coax both amazing purity and complexity. Within the valleys and around Queenstown, sunlight hours average 1,921, with rainfall averaging 913 millimeters or 36 inches. Alexandra to the southeast is in the rain shadow and sees 2,025 sunlight hours and 360 millimeters or 14 inches of rainfall, making it the driest wine growing region in the country. Even though the summer is described as hot, we still need to remember what their definition of hot is. Um, the mean temperature uh, during the summer months will get close to 30 degrees Celsius or 86 Fahrenheit. Uh, something to know, many parts of New Zealand have experienced truly hot temperatures the last several years for a few days here and there. We're talking like over 100, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I already kind of mentioned this. But by no means do they have weeks of days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. In the previous episode, I mentioned New Zealand's proximity to the South Pole's ozone hole. Well, here in central Otago, the UV radiation will be at its most intense. So even more care needs to be given to protecting people and grapes. With the higher UV radiation, grape skins are thicker here as a natural reaction. These can result in wines of deeper color than expected. Now, the region is heavily influenced by glaciers, rivers, and lakes. This combined with the weather has created a wide variety of soils. This, include, uh, this includes broken schist, clay, silt loams, gravels, windblown sands, and less. Most of the soils have good drainage with stony subsoils with schist and gray wacky bedrock. There's only one official sub-GI, Bannockburn. However, there are some other regions to make note of. The Alexander Basin, Bendigo, Cromwell Basin, that has the towns of Cromwell, Pisa, and Lowburn, Gibston, and Wanaka. Bannockburn is at the bottom of the Cromwell Valley on the southern bank of the Kawaru River. It extends farther 
south along the Bannockburn River and also that also follows the Bannockburn Road. It's warmer here than most other places in the area and sees less rainfall. Gibston is just east of Queenstown along the Kawaro Gorge. The highest elevation vineyards are found here and has a cool climate. Harvest is up to a month later than the other surrounding regions. The Cromwell Basin is on the western side of Lake Dunstan. Vineyards are found on lower terraces in the valley floor. Bendigo is north of Lake Dunstan, but on the eastern side of the valley. Wanaka is on the southern part of Lake Wanaka. Finally, Alexandra is to the southeast. Here is where the first plantings were planted in 1864. Dry, sunny, hot and cold, it's truly a continental climate. Schist is dominant here. A total of 2,055 hectares of vineyards are planted here. The top varieties are Pinot Noir at 1,656 hectares, Pinot Gris at 172 hectares, Chardonnay at 92 hectares, Riesling at 62 hectares, Sauvignon Blanc at 40 hectares, and then other 19 varieties at 33 hectares. As you've probably noticed, once we get south of Marlboro, Pinot Noir becomes the most planted variety and Sauvignon Blanc's important declines. If not for Marlboro's 2,733 hectares of Pinot Noir, Central Otago would have the most acreage under vine in the country. Some producers to pay attention to are Amosfield Winery, Felton Road Wines, Gibson Valley Winery, Mount Difficulty Wines, Peregrine Wines, Prophet's Rock, Quartz Reef Cellar Door, Ripon, Valley Wine. Whew. Okay, I think that's it. I'm sure I could have included more things, but honestly, if you know most of the stuff, you'll be fine for just about any level uh, exam with the court, even WSET or any other organization, I imagine. Okay, that's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and then tell your friends, and we'll see you next time with some wine.